fix the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and the treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing stronger than you nor there's nothing nothing is greater than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness of failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Your mercy and grace won't find me again.
morning. How are we doing today? Good. Good. So I'm, I'm awfully excited because I asked, how much time do I have? And the answer was, you know, I don't really know. <laughs> One of my favorite little snippet stories in the Bible is um, Paul was, was teaching a Bible study in a room upstairs. And he was talking for so long, this kid fell out the window and died. And he went out there and resurrected and went back up, and they kept preaching. So I'm going to try and reenact that today. <laughs> no, uh, I, I truly am grateful to be here. I, I hope that this message that has been placed on my heart um, just benefits you guys. I, I hope that it touches you individually, and I hope that it touches you as a church, as this this transformational process that you guys are going through right now. God has a man planned, prepared for this pulpit, and he will come in here, and God will grow your church through him. I fully believe that. And it's through this, this valley in between those times that God chooses to grow. That, that song, there's a line in it that said, uh, the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Oh man, I believe that. I believe that so much. And I think through um, today and next week that you're going to see how God is. The God of the mountain and of the valley. Um, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray that you would uh, speak through me that the words that I say today would be yours and not mine. I pray, Lord, that, that this lesson that has been placed on my heart, again, would just touch in to the lives here. And to all those watching online and, and the different... Uh, ways that they're, they're going to see this in the future, Lord. We thank you for that ability and that, that uh, venue that we are able to use to share your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, fair warning, this, this sermon, uh, the, both sermons are plagiarized. <laughs> the sermon themselves is not, but the idea is. I've got this friend, his, his name is John O'Leary, and he is quite possibly in the top five most amazing men I've ever met in my life. When he was nine years old, he was playing with gasoline, and it went bad. And he was burned on 100% of his body. Uh, I think it was something like 96% of it was third degree. That is an absolute death sentence. Especially back in the in the um, 80s, the early 80s when it happened, there's no way a child that young can withstand that much damage and survive. But it was through six questions that he was able to survive, and not just to survive, but to truly thrive, to truly make his life worth living. So the first three questions were questions that he had, that he found that he was asking, and that he learned if he wanted to live, he had to throw them away. Verse three, or why me? Who cares and what more can I do? They are pitiful, pathetic questions asked by a loser who has nowhere to go. And he learned that if he wanted to move forward, he had to get rid of those three questions and ask three totally different questions. Those three totally different questions are, why me? Who cares? And what more can I do? It's all in your heart. God cares about the things of the heart, not of the outward appearance. And when we stop asking from the position of a victim going, why do I have to go through this? And we start asking, saying, why do I get to go through this? That's where the transformation in our lives can happen. <clears throat> I'm going to read a, a decent portion of scripture today. Um, it's Judges chapter 6. We're going to be talking about Gideon. And I, I, I love this portion of scripture because it's so encouraging about what God can do through us, but it's also amazing 
in just the absolute abundance of lessons that we can learn in these three short chapters in the Bible. We meet Gideon in chapter 6. And Gideon is hiding, he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now for those of you who don't know what threshing wheat is, it's typically done on a mountain. On top of a mountain, they flatten out a surface, they pack the ground, or they'll lay in stones. So it's a good flat, hard surface. And they take the, the wheat harvest and they throw it on there and they stomp it and trample on it and beat it with sticks. And then they take their pitchforks and they, on a windy day, and they'll scoop it up and throw it. And the wind will blow all the shaft away. And then the grain will fall back down. And once they've gotten all the shaft removed, then they're able to sweep up the grain and put it in their stores and save it. But Gideon wasn't doing that on a mountain. Gideon was doing that in a valley. Gideon was doing that dirty, hard job that is only helped by exposure and wind in a hidden place because he was so scared. Because he was asking, because the Midianites were oppressing him so badly, he was asking, why me? Who cares how hard this is to do it this way? I'm going to keep hiding. Because I don't want to be found. I don't want them to come steal my harvest. I want to, to stay under the radar, if you will. So he was hiding. And God came to him and said, Gideon, a mighty man of valor. He was anything but a mighty man of valor. But God saw that in him. Again, God is the God of the mountains and of the valleys. And Gideon was in a valley, and God was about to bring him up onto a mountain. Starting in verse 13, Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord God turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Gideon, being scared, being worried, not seeing the potential that God sees in him, asked another why me question. So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. I'm the smallest runt from the smallest clan from the most insignificant tribe of Israel. Why would you use me? Why me? Then God says to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now you see a transformation. And, and you see Gideon saying, Now if I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. Once you stop asking, why me? And start asking, why me? That changes your heart and you start wanting to glorify and start wanting to move forward. We're doing communion, talking about Jesus and, and his sacrifice and his blood. I got to thinking about the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus asked, why me? Why do I have to go? Lord God, I don't want to do this. But, he said, your will, not mine. All glory be unto you. When you choose to stop living as that victim and choose to walk through the hardship that God gives you, that God allows you to go through, that God will grow you through, your desire becomes to give Him glory. And when you care about giving Him glory, nothing matters. Nothing matters. So now Gideon perceived that he, he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He's going, this is amazing. Why me? Why am I so blessed that I get to see this angel face? So now because he has stopped walking and seeing himself as a coward, and he started seeing himself as a valiant man, 
He's accepted the identity and he's accepted the task that has been placed on him. He starts asking that other question again. He starts saying, who cares? But before he was saying, who cares how hard it is to do this the coward's way? I'm going to do it because I'm scared. Now God gives him a task and he says, who cares? Because I want to glorify God, who cares what other people think? Who cares how hard it's going to be? Who cares how dangerous it's going to be? Because God has given me this task, I will glorify him through it. So God tells him, take your father's bulls, the second one of two years old, and go up on top of the high place and tear down the Ashtaroth, the, the place of worship for Baal. Tear down the Ashtaroth and tear down the wooden altar that is next to it, and build up an altar according to my direction. And kill your father's bull and burn it as a sacrifice on top of that new altar where I have taken the bad and turned it into good. So Gideon says, who cares? And he goes and he takes ten men. And they do it at night because he's new to this. And he's still a little, a little fearful. But he does it nonetheless. They do it at night, and he tears down this altar, and he, he kills his father's bull and sacrifices it on the new altar, on the altar for God, for the true God. Now, this is a big who cares. Because what were the bulls used for? That's what they used to drag the plow. That's what they used to cultivate the fields. That's how his father provided for the family. I drive a log truck for a living. That's a big bull. That's all it is. It's a tool that I use. Do you think I'd be a little bit upset if one of my sons took it, <laughs> tore it apart, and burned it? <laughs> yeah, I would be. But that's, that's the flesh operating. When, when we have the courage to say, who cares, God's going to protect us from that flesh. If you read on, all the men of the city were, they were angry because Gideon had just torn down this altar to Baal. And they wanted to kill him for it. They wanted to sacrifice him to Baal so that Baal could have some of his glory back. But Gideon's father having a transformation of his heart because he's starting to see this courage and his son, he, he starts asking that who cares question too. And he starts saying, let Baal defend Baal. If he truly is a god, if he truly has any power whatsoever, he can defend himself. Let, let's go ahead and put this to the test. Let's see if this god that we were worshiping is powerful enough to defend himself. And nothing happened. So often we trust in things from the world around us to give us our security. But when we put them to the test, we find out they have no power. But when you put God to the test, you find out that there is power abundant. There's more than you could ever need. There's more than you could ever So again, Gideon asks, who cares? <clears throat> uh, verse 34, starting at verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, and the Abizarites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers through all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. When you truly walk into and stand into the position of who cares, you have power. And you can take those baby steps where you're doing it at night. But then when you start to step into it and truly go, who cares? I'm going to do what is right people will flock to you. 
instead of hiding at night, knowing that what you're going to do is going to get found out, but hoping that just for whatever reason, when you do it at night, it's when it comes into the daylight, it's not as well known to going, you know what, I'm going to stand up here, I'm going to blow this trumpet, I'm going to let everybody know I'm following God. I am doing what he has called me to do. People will flock to you. A little story about this. I, I work with a program down in Missouri called Focus Marines Foundation. And I am so indebted to this program because I was going through hell. I was miserable. I was angry. I was quite literally murderous. That there were, were days where it took every ounce of my strength to keep me from using my hands and using the skills that I learned in the Marine Corps to inflict the pain that I was going through on everyone around. That's all I wanted to do. Well, I went to this program and I met a lot of amazing people, John O'Leary being one of them, and I learned that I was asking the, why me? Who cares? What more can I do? I might as well just give up. And I wanted to give up because life had nothing to offer me anymore. And I was going through that program that I, I learned life has more to offer me than what I, what I had admitted. But what I truly realized was that I had more to offer life than what I had admitted. And it wasn't because of my particular strengths or my particular abilities. It was because of how my father was going to use those strengths and abilities in my life. I was blessed to be able to return back to that program as a mentor after I'd gone through it as a participant. They saw this transformation from this guy who wanted nothing more than to, to hurt and destroy, turning into a guy who, who wanted nothing more than to help people. And so they started bringing me back as a mentor. And I was, I was walking with Christ and, and trying to pray and, and learn how to use my abilities, how to glorify Him. And I started feeling like, this program is good, but it is missing something. What do you think it was missing? Missing God. So I decided I was going to bring God to that program. That He wanted me to bring Him there. So I started to say, who cares? I'm going to do this. So I'd pay attention, and when, when people in the class would say something about their faith, or they would mention God or whatever, I, I would walk up to them on a break, off on the side, and say, hey, if, if you'd like to, I'd, I'd love to talk about God with you. you know, let's, let's meet up tonight and, and do a little Bible study. And I did that for a while, and as I continued to do that, my, my courage continued to grow to where I was inviting all comers I didn't care who you were, I didn't care how rotten you were, because let's face it, the most rotten you got the most. I remember one time there was a hell's angel in the class, a bona fide patch wearing just a mean dude. And I just, I knew, you know what, if anybody here needs God, it's him. So every day I'd go up to him and ask him. Hey, man, why don't you come up to Bible study and, and just see what he's got to offer? And he never took it up. But I, I learned that it doesn't matter whether they accept your invitation or not. It doesn't matter how they reject you. What matters is that you are faithful to say who cares and ask. I, that was the, the most unique rejection I ever got. He, he looked at me and he goes, well, you know, you know it's kind of awkward because <clears throat> you, you worship a God who died on a piece of wood, nailed to a piece of wood, and I worship a God that carries a hammer. I broke my heart hearing it. But the fact of the matter was 
I had the courage to ask him, and he respected me enough to tell me why he didn't want to come. He didn't make up some, some you know, he, it, it was kind of a stupid response, but it was, it was him showing me his heart. I don't care. I said, okay. And God's going to weed those people out of your lives. Maybe me asking him was planting the seed. Maybe somewhere down the line he will become saved. I don't know. I was just obedient to say, who cares? Hey, dude, come on up. And as I continued to, to work through that, the, the Bible study quickly became a fundamental part of the FOCUS program. It was kind of funny, after I had been doing it for about two years, you know, going down there four times a year and leading the Bible study, uh, maybe it was a year and a half, I had somebody from the board call me and ask me if I would be willing to do it. <laughs> and I said, you can try and stop me. Because I don't care. The only way you can stop me from doing this Bible study is to stop flying me down here. Because where I go, I will share God. Because I don't care what people think about me. It was through me saying, who cares, that I got to meet some amazing people. That I got to watch men who have lived these horrible, painful um, lives for years crumble and cry and ask God into their hearts and go, Is it okay for me to get baptized? Absolutely. The funny thing about that is, so this, this, this program is a beautiful location. There's this awesome 40-acre lake. It's got a bunch of islands on it. There's some gorgeous log cabins built along the shoreline of it. Nobody's allowed to get in that water. Nobody's allowed to swim in there of insurance reasons and whatever, and I, I totally understand that. And this guy asked me, hey, will you baptize me? And I said, sure. Come meet me in my room. And I started filling the tub with water. This isn't right. There's a lake right there that's filtered by God. Why am I using this little tub? And I shut the water off, and I pulled the plunger up, and I said, no, we're not doing it this way. Let's go. I don't, I don't care. I don't care what the owner says. We're doing this the right way. And we went down into that lake and we baptized him. And I haven't kept count pers uh, purposefully because the number shouldn't matter. But I know I've baptized over 30 men in that lake since that day. Because of who cares. I don't care what they think of me and I don't care what they're going to do to me. They can't stop me from sharing my God with those around me. <clears throat> so doing that who cares leads us into that last question, the what more can I do, which we started asking as losers. We started asking that as, as victims, saying, I'm just beating my head against a wall. What more can I do? Well, asking what more can I do opens so many doors and you get to touch so many people. But if you want to hear about that one, you got to come back next week. <laughs> one thing that, that I'm going to say here is watch out. Pay attention because you never know when you're going to start ans asking these questions the wrong way again. It sneaks up on you big time. This last week, it was, it was pretty funny, you know, looking back on it. Um, I, I was pretty upset. I had, had some things going on. Life wasn't going too great. And I was in the dumps pretty bad. And right now we're, we're hauling timber out of the bighorns up above Buffalo. So I've got a, quite a bit of uh, windshield time all by myself with nothing to do but think. So what do you think I started doing? I started getting angry. Why me? This is bull crap. You know what? I'm just going to give up. Who cares? Who cares how, how 
dropping my pack and giving up hurts my wife. What more can I do? I'm just beating my head against the wall. And I knew I needed to pray, but I couldn't because I was so angry. The, when, when, I would, when I would start to try and, and give God honor, it almost felt like, like vomit coming up because I was so angry. So I started yelling at him. He's a big boy. He can handle it. But that's what it took. Because after I got my frustrations out, driving along about a half hour in silence, all of a sudden I started laughing. Because I realized, wow, you know what, this weekend I'm going to go preach a sermon about asking, who cares? Why me and what more can I do? And here I am sitting in my truck, throwing a pity party, getting all ticked off about the same thing. And it was just God allowing me to be in that valley so that he could raise me back up to the mountain because he is the God of both places. God knows who we are. And if we allow him to, he will show us who we are as well. So thank you. I, I think I'm ending on time. Nobody fell out of a window. We didn't have to do any miracles, so we're all good there. Thank you so much for allowing me to join you this week. And um, as long as nobody calls me and tells me don't come back, I'll see you again next week. Uh, I, I truly do love this church, um, not just because my mom sings here, but because of, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I had applied for the, the pastor's position here. And I, I went into it knowing that God was going to put, he had somebody designed for this spot. And I just went into it going, if it's me, it's me. If it's not, it's not. Either way, I'm going to be obedient. We're going to go through the process, and we're going to see what happens. They decided to pass on me, and that's good, because apparently it, it wasn't supposed to be me, and I'm good with that. But, man, I just getting to know the pulpit committee and hearing their passion for the body of believers in this church and hearing their passion for how they want this church to grow, it touched me. And I, because of their passion, I know that this church will grow and it will thrive. And God is bringing you into a new season. Um, so I just want to thank you for allowing me to be here and, and help fill in the interim. And I, I do honestly pray for you guys and know that, that um, better things are in store. So, thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I pray again over this church. Lord God, the church is not the building, it's the people in the seats. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would grow them, Lord God, and that you would show them who they are, Lord God. That you would speak into each and every heart here, each and every person watching this online, and say, you are a mighty man of God. You are a mighty woman of valor. I don't care where you're hiding, and I don't care what's going on in your life right now. I'm going to work through you. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give each and every one of us the courage to allow you to work through us, to show us who we are, Lord God. If I have said anything that is contrary to your word or your will, I pray, Lord, that it will be forgotten before we leave this room, that it will be forgotten before I stop. Thank you, Lord, for these things. In Jesus' name. Now, when I end a video, I, I run a, an organization called Warrior Way Ministries, and, and most of the messages are just put online for people to watch. Every time I end the video, I take my weapon, and I point it at the camera, and I say, now go and make war. Because that's what God called Gideon to do. And that's what God has called us to do. We war according to the weapons he has given us. But as long as we stay founded in this, don't take my word for it. Don't take any other pastor's word for it. Get in this book. Learn it for yourself. That's where the power of your life will come from. So now I part with you guys. Go and make war. Thank you. Thank you, son. Let's all stand. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost.
Oh, 